We all know the beloved story of the sister duo of Anna and Elsa, and Frozen by the beloved Disney. But did you know, this is not the original story. Sadly, the original story had no lovable snowman or a sister duo who finds out everything can be worked out with love. But that's what I'm here for. I will be reading the original story of the Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. Chapter 1 Which Treats of a Mirror and of the Splinters Now then, let us begin. When we are at the end of the story, we shall know more than we know now. But, to begin. Once upon a time, there was a wicked sprite. Indeed, he was the most mischievous of all sprites. One day, he was in a very good humor. For he had made a mirror with the power of causing all that was good and beautiful when it was reflected in to look poor and mean. But that which was good for nothing and looked ugly was shown magnified and increased in ugliness. In this mirror, the most beautiful landscapes looked like boiled spinach, and the best person was turned into a frightful being or appeared to stand on their head. Their faces were so distorted that they were not to be recognized. And if anyone had a mole, you might be sure that it would be magnified and spread over both nose and mouth. That's glorious fun, said the sprite. If a good thought passed through a man's mind, then a grin was seen in the mirror, and the sprite laughed heartily at his discovery. All the little sprites who went to his school, for he kept a sprite school, told each other that a miracle had happened, and that now only as they thought, it would be possible to see how the world really looked. They ran about with a mirror, and at last, there was not a land or a person who was not represented distorted in the mirror. So then they thought they would fly up to the sky and joke around. The higher that they flew with the mirror, the more terribly it grinned. They could hardly hold it. Higher and higher still they flew, nearer and nearer to the stars, when suddenly, the mirror shook so terribly that it flew out of their hands and fell to the earth, where it was dashed in hundred million and more pieces. And now it worked much more evil than before, for some of the pieces were hardly so large as a grain of sand. And they flew about in the wide world, and when they got into people's eyes, there they stayed. And then people saw everything, preferredly, or only had an eye for that which was evil. This happened because the very smallest bit had the same power which the whole mirror had possessed. Some person even got a splinter in their heart, and then it made one shudder, for their heart became like a lump of ice. Some of the broken pieces were so large that they were used for window panes, through which one could not see one's friend. Other pieces were put in the spectacles, and that was a sad affair when people put on their glasses to see well and rightly. Then the wicked sprite <laughs> laughed till he almost choked. For all this tickled his fancy. This fine splinter still flew about in the air, and now we shall hear what happened next. Chapter 2 A Little Boy and a Little Girl In a large town where there are so many houses and so many people that there is no roof left for everybody to have a little garden, and where, on this account, most persons are obliged to content themselves with flowers and pots, there lived two little children who had a garden somewhat larger than a flower pot. They were not brother and sister, but they cared for each other as much as if they were. Their parents lived exactly opposite of each other. They inhabited two garrets, and where the roof of the one house joined that of the other, and the gutter ran along the extreme end of it. 
There was to each house a small window. One needed only to step over the gutter to get from one window to the other. The children's parents had large wooden boxes there, in which vegetables for the kitchen were planted, and little rose trees as well. There was a rose in each box, and they grew splendidly. They now thought of placing the boxes across the gutter so that they were nearly reached from one window to the other and looked just like two walls of flowers. The tendrils of the peas hung down over the boxes and the rose trees shot up long branches twined around the windows and then bent towards each other. It was almost like a triumphant arc of foliage and flowers. The boxes were very high and the children knew that they must not creep over them. So they often obtained permission to get out of the windows to go see each other and to sit on their little stools among the roses where they could play delightfully. In winter, there was an end of this pleasure. The windows were often frozen out shut, but then they heated copper farthings on the stove and laid the hot farthing on the window pane, and then they had fun people, quite nicely rounded, and out of each peeped a gently friendly eye. And it was the little boy and the little girl who were looking out. In summer, his name was with one jump, they Hers could get to each other. But in winter, they were obliged first to go down the long stairs, and then up the long stairs again. And out of doors, there was quite a snowstorm. It is the white bees that are swarming, said Katie's old grandmother. Do the white bees choose a queen? asked the little boy, for he knew that the honeybees always have one. Yes, said the grandmother. She flies where the swarm hangs in the thickest clusters. She is the largest of all, and she can never remain quietly on the earth, but goes up again into the black clouds. Many a winter's night she flies through the streets of the town and peeps in the windows, and they then freeze in so wondrous manner that they look like flowers. Yes, I have seen it, said both children. And so they knew this was true. Can the Snow Queen come in? said the little girl. Only let her come in, said the little boy. Then I'd put her on the stove and she'd melt. And then his grandmother patted his head and told him other stories. In the evening, when little Kay was at home and half undressed, he climbed up on the chair by the window and peeped out of the little hole. A few snowflakes were falling, and one, the largest of all, remained lying on the edge of the flower pot. The flake of snow grew larger and larger, and at last it was like a young lady dressed in the finest white gauze made of a million little flakes like stars. She was so beautiful, so delicate, but she was of ice, of dazzling, sparkling ice. Yet she lived. Her eyes gazed fixedly like two stars, but there was neither quiet responsive. She nodded towards the window and beckoned with her hand. The little boy was frightened and jumped down from the chair. It seemed to him as if, at the same moment, a large bird flew past the window. The next day it was sharp frost and then spring came. The sun shone, the green leaves appeared, and the swallows built their nests. The windows were opened, and the little children again sat in their pretty garden, high up on the lid, at the top of the house. That summer, the roses flowered in unwatted beauty. The little girl had learned a hymn, in which there was something about roses, and then she thought of her own flowers, and she sang first to the little boy, who then sang it with her. The rose in the valley is blue, so sweet, and angels still sing. The children held each other by the hand, kissed the roses, looked up at the clear sunshine, and spoke as though they really saw angels there. What lovely summer days these were! How delightful to be out in the air, near the fresh rose bushes that seem as if they would never finish blooming. Kay and Gerda looked at the picture book full of beasts and birds, and it was then the clock in the church tower was just striking five that Kay said, Oh! I feel such a sharp pain in my heart, and now something has gotten into my eye. The little girl put her arms around his neck. He winked his eyes. Now there was nothing to be seen. I, I think it's out now, said he, but it was not. It was just one of those pieces of glass from the magic mirror that had gotten into his eye. Poor Kay, 
I got another piece right into his heart. It will soon become like ice. It did not hurt any longer, but there it was. What are you crying for? Asked he. You look so ugly! There's nothing the matter with me! Said he at once. The rose is cankered. And look, this one is it quite crooked! After all, these roses are very ugly! They are just like the box that they are planted in! Then he gave the box a good kick with his foot and pulled both the roses up. What are you doing? Cried the little girl. As he perceived her fright, he pulled up another rose, got in at the window, and hastened off from the dear little girl. Afterwards, when she brought her picture book, he asked, What horrid beast have you there? And if his grandmother told them stories, he always interpreted her. Besides, if he could manage it, he would get behind her, put on her spectacles, and imitate her way of speaking. He copied all her ways, and then everybody laughed at him. He was soon able to imitate the gait and manner of everyone in the street, everything that was peculiar and displeasing in them, which Kay knew how to imitate. And at such times, all the people said, the boy is certainly very clever. But it was the glass he had got in his eye, the glass that was sticking in his heart, which made him tease even little Gerda, whose whole soul was devoted to him. His games were now quite different to what they formerly had been. They were so very knowing. One winter's day, when the flakes of snow were flying about, he spread the skirts of his blue coat and caught the snow as it fell. Look through this glass, Gerda, said he, and every flake seemed larger and appeared like a magnificent flower or beautiful star. It was splendid to look at. Look how clever, said Kay. That's much more interesting than real flowers. They're as exact as possible. There is not a fault in them if they did not melt. It was not long after this that Kay came one day with large gloves on and his little sled at his back and bawled right into Gerda's ears. I have permission to go out into the square where the others are playing, and off he was in a moment. There in the marketplace, some of the boldest of the boys used to tie their sleds to the carts as they passed by, and so they were pulled along and got a good ride. It was so joyous! Just as they were in the very height of their amusement, a large sled passed by. It was painted quite white, and there was someone in it, wrapped up in a rough white mantle of fur. With the white fur cap on his head, the sled drove round the square twice, and Kay tied on his sled as quickly as he could, and off he drove with it. On they went quicker and quicker into the next street, and the person who drove turned round to Kay and nodded to him in a friendly manner, just as if they knew each other. Every time he was going to untie his sled, the person nodded to him, and the case sat quiet. And so on they went, till they came outside the gates of town. Then the snow began to fall so thickly that the little boy could not see an arm's length before him. But still on he went, when suddenly he let go of the string he held in his hands in order to get loose from the sled. But it was of no use. Still the little vehicle rushed on with quickness of the wind. He then cried as loud as he could. But no one heard him. The snow drifted as the sled flew on, and sometimes it gave a jerk as though they were driving over hedges and ditches. He was quite frightened, and he tried to repeat the Lord's Prayer, but all he could do was remember the multiplication tables. The snowflakes grew larger and larger, till at last they looked just like great white fowls. Suddenly, they flew on one side, the large sled stopped, and the person who drove rose up. It was a lady. Her cloak and cap were of snow. She was tall and slender, with a dazzling whiteness. It was the Snow Queen. We have traveled fast, said she, but it is freezing cold. Come under my bearskin. She put him in the sled beside her, wrapped the fur around him. He felt as though he had received him with snowflakes. Are you still cold? asked she, and then she kissed his forehead. A hope's colder than ice that penetrated to his very heart, which was already almost frozen. It seemed to him as if he was about to die. But a moment more, and it was quite congenial to him, and he did not remark the cold that was around him. My sled! Do not forget my sled! It was the first thing he thought of. It was there, tied to one of the white chickens, which flew along with it on his back behind the large sled. The Snow Queen kissed Kay once more, and then he forgot little Gerda. Grandmother, 
and all of whom he had left at his home. Now you will have no more kisses, said she, or else I should kiss you to death. Kay looked at her. She was very beautiful, a more clever or more lovely countenance. He could not fancy it himself, and she was no longer appeared of his eyes as before. When she sat outside the window and beckoned to him in his eyes, she was perfect. He did not fear her at all, and he told her that he could calculate in his head and with fractions even, that he knew that the number of square miles there were in the different countries, and how many inhabitants there contained, and she smiled while he spoke. It then seemed to him as if what he knew was not enough, and he looked upwards in the large, huge, empty space above him, and on she flew with him, flew high over the black clouds while the storm moaned and whistled as he thought it was singing some old tune. On they flew over woods and lakes, over seas and many lands, and beneath them the chilling storm rushed fast, the wolves howled, and snow crackled above them, flew large screaming crows, but higher up appeared the moon, quite large and bright, and it was on it that Kay gazed during the long, long winter's night, while by day 